Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining. Uh, this is really great to see everyone here. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, webinar speaker today. Um, so we're going to be joined by Kerry, uh, who's from the Scottish environmental charity called FIDRA. Um, and um, if you didn't know about FIDRA, there um, one thing that I learned about them not too lo um, not too long ago was that they had a really great project, uh, which was the cotton bug cotton bug project, which they were campaigning about to um, get manufacturers and retailers to change their plastic cotton bud sticks to paper cotton buds. And this was successful. This was a campaign that was led by FIDRA. And um, that was really cool. <laughs> so like, you know, like a really cool fact about this great environmental charity is that they've uh, get, got this really great successful single use plastic action in the UK. So which is really cool. So um, and they do lots of lots of really great work on environmental projects and plastic kind of campaigning on plastic pollution. And um, so it's it's really great to have them from here and you, you'll be able to find out a little bit more about the charity and what they're doing. So I hope you enjoy and thanks a lot. And I'll pass you over to Kerry. So here we go. Hi, here everybody. Go. Hope you can hear me OK. Um, it's bedtime in my house and my husband is failing. So hopefully my sound's OK. But if you hear interruptions, that's what it is. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen with you. Um, let's see if this works. OK, so. I'm happy for anybody to interrupt me throughout it, but just so you know, I'm looking at the presentation. So if you want to interrupt me, then shout rather than waving. Um, otherwise, answer. I can answer any questions at the end of it. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about PFAS. Um, so it's not plastic, it's chemical, um, but there is a very important link to plastic and plastic packaging that I'll get on to later. So hopefully by the end of this, I'm going to tell you a bit more about PFAS, the issue, what they're used for, um, where they're used and most importantly you know what can we do about these and how can we solve this issue um, so yeah just a quick outline of the presentation so what are PFAS where are they used what's the problem what's the solution where are we now and then hopefully plenty of time for questions afterwards so PFAS are per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances but you don't need to remember the name um, for the non-chemists what this means is that they're basically very long chains of carbon atoms, similar to a pearl necklace. So carbon atoms all joined together and some of them have fluorine attached to them. And it's the carbon fluorine bond. That's what makes PFAS a group. That's what gives them the really important properties that I'll talk about later. So there's lots of different types of them. Some of them are polymers, which are really, 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 really long chains. Some of them are non polymers. So they're chains made of often six to eight carbon atoms. So they're, they're still chains, but they're much shorter. Um, and yeah, the really important thing to know is that PFAS isn't a chemical. It's a group of chemicals. There's thought to be over 5,000 different types of PFAS, and more of them are continually being developed all the time. Um, the latest estimate, I think, is now up to 9,000, depending on how they're defined. But it's a really big group of chemicals. So you might not have heard of PFAS. You've maybe heard of PFCs. So Greenpeace did a big campaign on PFCs, particularly in outdoor gear. These are the same as PFAS for all intents and purposes. It's a different name for them. People have moved towards using the term PFAS because it's slightly more scientifically accurate, but they're the same things. If you see PFC free, that means it's PFAS free. Um, they're also sometimes known as fluorocarbons. So you may see something with zero fluorocarbon. This is a waterproofing um, repellent in the picture. So fluorocarbons, um, they're also known as forever chemicals. And this has particularly taken off since Dark Waters, the movie that was out, ee, when was it? March this year, um, it got released in cinemas. Um, but particularly the campaign in the US has focused on this term forever chemicals, which I'll explain later. So these are also PFAS. Teflon is a brand. So there are some TF uh, Teflon now that are being produced without PFAS, but by and large, Teflon is the brand name for a particular type of PFAS. Um, and also PTFE. So PTFE is something you'd see on lubricants. Uh, bike chain oils quite often come with PTFE. And, you know, it's sold as something that people want to buy. This, this is something that contains PTFE. But these are actually polymer versions of PFAS. So they're really, really long chains of PFAS molecules. So PFAS was first produced completely by accident back in 1938. 
and um, there is no natural sources of PFAS in the environment all the PFAS that's in our environment has been completely man-made so it was first discovered by a chemist who was experimenting on Freon refrigerants in DuPont um, in the US so this scientist Roy J Plunkett found this white powder residue that was left over in his reaction canister and then when he started to test this, he found that it was insoluble in cold water, hot water, acetone, freon, ether, petroleum, loads of everything. He tried everything he could and it wouldn't, um, it was completely insoluble in these. Um, it didn't char and it didn't melt when it was exposed to a soldering iron or an electric arc. It didn't rot or swell with moisture. It didn't degrade into sunlight and it was almost completely impervious to mold and fungus. So, you know, this was really exciting. This was a really sturdy material that people hadn't come across before. So the next thing that happened was in 1942, there was the Manhattan Project and DuPont agreed to design and build chemical, chemical separation plants linked to nuclear weapons. They needed something that would stand up to the really corrosive starting materials um, like uranium hexafluoride gas. And it destroyed all the conventional gaskets and seals that they used in the machinery. PTFE um, was the only material that was strong enough and inert enough um, I, it was resistant to breakdown, to stand up to the really huge pressures they were looking at. So this is when they really started to find a function for it. It also went on to be used for the nose cones of proximity bombs. Again, just showing this real strength because it was really resistant. Um, it was also completely transparent to radar. And the key thing to take from this is that it's really, really hard to break down or to erode. And that's why they started to use it. So 1945, DuPont commercialized PTFE as Teflon. And what they had now was this basically the greatest non-stick product ever made. You know, nothing, not even a frying egg on a really high heat was going to bond to it. So it was really, really inert and non-stick. The problem initially was then getting it to bond to something like a frying pan so that you could actually use it. But once they'd solved that, then the uses just kept growing and they still are. So initially it was used in industrial applications, things like electrical insulation, um, but then on to gaskets, valve components, bearings, sealers, plates, a lot of industrial um, functions. By 1953, they started advertising Teflon coated nonstick for baking. Even back then, there was concern about some of the gases that were produced at high temperatures. So they marketed it for oven baking rather than stovetop consumer products. Um, but very quickly, you know, people started to see the benefits of their nonstick pans and it just, it, steamrolled so everybody wanted it and now it's something that we all expect and that we have in our homes um, so from the 1960s onwards we find more and more uses for PFAS more and more forms of PFAS were being developed and then we started to see some of these problems coming in so what we did was we regulated against a PFAS because we've seen environmental or human health harm and what that does is then it makes the manufacturers produce a different type of PFAS. So they try to get something that's chemically as similar as possible because that gives them the same function. But then that also gives them the same problem. So almost this regulatory system that we've set up where we're actually trying to stop the use of them has driven so many more of them to be produced. And that's why we're in a situation now where there is so many of them. Sorry, I'm flicking and nothing's happening. That's coming now. <laughs> so they've got a number of really useful properties. So as I said before, they're inert. So they're non-stick, they're slippery, they're non-reactive. They're very difficult to destroy. They're very good at repelling oil and water. And this is due to this carbon fluorine bond. There's a polarity in that. So both oil and water are repelled by them and they're surfacants. And what this means is that they help liquids to mix together, to stay in mixture and to spread. So because of these functions, we now find that they're being used in a whole variety of things. So stain resistance in clothing, school uniforms, um, durable water. Oh, I've lost everything. I'll talk you through it. There was meant to be pictures coming up there. <laughs> OK, I will tell you about them anyway. Um, so durable water repellency for things like outdoor clothing, tents, oil resistance in food packaging, firefighting foams to make the foam stable and make it spread over a fire. They're used in cosmetics to help them glide on smoothly. Um, they're used as ingredient, they help ingredients to mix effectively in personal care products, so shampoos and soaps. They're used in cleaning products to prevent them separating. Um, this ability to spread helps streak-free finishes on glass cleaners, waxes, floor polishes, 
Um, again, the stain resistance gives them for upholstery and carpets. PTFE is used in bike chain oils, ski and snowboard waxes, again, because they're slippery. Loads and loads of industrial processes and lubricants. They're now used in lubricants to, um, in wind turbine blades. And they're used in medical scrubs for both the stain resistance um, and in the lubricants they're used for medical machinery, PTFE based aortic replacements and bypasses. So we're actually putting them in people. Um, so there is so many uses that cover so many sectors of society now. It makes regulating them very, very difficult. So the problem with PFAS is that there are so many of them firstly, there's over 5,000 of them and counting. And this creates a huge problem for regulation and management. They are really, 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 really persistent. So this characteristic that defines this group is this carbon fluorine bond. And that bond is known to be one of the strongest bonds in nature. It's really difficult bond to break. And that's the reason it made them attractive as a chemical group in the first place. But it also what makes them really damaging and what really harmful. So we know that some of these chemicals have half lives in the environment of over a thousand years. So in a thousand years, the volume will decrease by half. Another thousand years, it'll decrease by half again. So they last for well over a thousand years. PFAS produced in the 40s, still being on our environment in the year 3050. And many more are being used and produced every single day. Um, many are known to be toxic to both wildlife and humans. Many of them we know really nothing about whatsoever. There's just so many with such a fast pace of development. And unfortunately, the way our regulatory system is set up, there's very little upfront research requirement. The onus is actually on public research to prove risk and harm before a product can then be taken off the market rather than industry proving safety before use. So even you know, fully funded, it can take decades. You know, at the minute we're regulating one per decade. And there's such a huge number of PFAS, it's just not feasible. And that's why we need to start looking at precautionary measures. So we talk a lot about the precautionary approach when we're looking at chemical groups. So that you're not regulating it as an individual PFAS like we're doing now, but you start to look at the full group and take a more pragmatic approach. Um, they're also very mobile in the environment. So they, they're found very far from source. These aren't a problem that's contained we're finding them in the Arctic and the Antarctic, well beyond, we're far away from anywhere that's produced or used them. They bioaccumulate. Um, so, you know, they're slow to be eliminated from our bodies. They can stay in our body for, you know, five to seven years for some of these. And all the time we're exposed to them, they're building up and they're building up and they're building up. And the effect on wildlife is very similar. So they build up in their bodies and accumulate along food chains. So if you imagine a plankton with a few PFAS molecules in their body, the fish eats lots of plankton, so they get a higher dose of PFAS. The puffin here eats lots more fish. So again, he's getting a higher concentration and up and up until the highest levels are found in these iconic top predators. So it's UK seabirds, it's polar bears, whales, dolphins, and ourselves, because we're top predators. You know, and a large proportion of the PFAS that we get in our system is coming from animal food products. And they are in all of us. We can't get away from them. 99% of people are tested for PFAS in their blood. Um, it crosses the placenta, it's found in breast milk. So, you know, babies are being born with PFAS already in their bodies. Um, this diagram just shows you a bit more about how it spreads through the environment. So, you know, it spreads in the ocean, it spreads through food chains and it spreads in air. We're finding it actually coming out in, in rain. So it's being washed out of air masses in rain and it is just getting everywhere. We can't contain it. Um, we know that it's causing harm. Uh, there's a huge lack of evidence for a lot of them. There's a couple of them that are well studied and this is what most of the science is based on. So we know that PFAS is present in a wide range of wildlife. It's great for making presentations like this because I just pick an animal I want to show you and I can find research to back it up to say it's in those animals. You know, but we really need to get a control of this. Um, a lot less is known about the impact this is having. So there's some emerging evidence that links PFAS exposure to brain and reproductive systems, um, hormonal systems of polar bears, immune system and kidney and liver function of bottlenose dolphins. And there's a lot of research coming out looking at the immune system and sea otters as well. So this is really damaging wildlife populations at that population level. Um, and of course, you know, we're adding these chemical burdens onto wildlife that are already under huge stress from human activities, from habitat loss, climate change, and it's really fueling that ongoing biodiversity crisis. 
Um, and they're, you know, it's really important to deal with persistent chemicals in the environment. We've got to learn from our mistakes because we've been here before. We have PCBs that were banned in the early 80s and they're still harming wildlife today. We can't take them back. They're there and the damage is long lasting. And that's why, you know, even before we're absolutely conclusive evidence of harm, before we know exactly what they're going to do in the environment, we have to take action because they're persistent. And what we do today just won't go away. Um, so these are just some examples of, you know, these sort of persistent chemicals and why we need to deal with them with such urgency. Um, it's, a, it's a problem for human health as well. So the largest epidem epidemiological study ever carried out linked PFOA, uh, which is one form of PFAS, um, to exposure to high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. So this is the story that's been told in the Dark Waters film and in uh, Exposure, which is Rob Ballot's book on the same subject. So he's the uh, US lawyer that took on DuPont and these are what they found in a seven year study, eight year study possibly even with the CE at Science panel. So these are the findings that can be, that stood up in a court of law. Um, these aren't, this isn't everything. These are just the ones that they could link enough to prosecute um, in court. EU official classifications for PFOA and PFOS, which is another early used PFAS, um, include carcinogenic, reprotoxic, lact, um, and toxic to specific organs, in this case, the liver. We know as well, so EFSA, which is the environment, uh, sorry, the European Food Standards Agency, they put out a scientific opinion last year where they broadened the scope, so they're no longer just looking at PFOA and PFOS, which were the initial two that we looked at, to a few more, I say a few more, because there's still so many more we don't know anything about, but these were the only ones that they could find enough research to conclusively link to, to see what the effect on humans are. And they've linked it to reduced antibody response to vaccination, increased propensity for infection, increased levels of cholesterol and low birth weight. They've also looked and found um, enough evidence to conclusively link it to changes in the liver, thyroid and testosterone levels, increased fetal and neonatal mortality, developmental neurotoxic effects, and an increase in tumour development in animal studies. How these translate into humans is still very unclear. Um, and the effect over long time scales, that's something else that's very unclear. It's very hard to understand not just what this is doing if you're exposed to one of them, but what's it doing if you're exposed to loads of them. So most of our limits, you can have a certain amount of PFOA, you can have a certain amount of PFOS, but what happens when you have both of them at the same time? That's one of the questions that we're really missing. And what happens if you're exposed to these over your whole lifespan? So as I say, babies are now born with these in their bodies. And it's that really long life. That's what we don't understand the effect it's having. So what's the solution? Um, so PFAS just sustain resistance for school uniforms. This was the first thing that we at FIDRA looked at. And the reason we chose this was because it seemed like a very unnecessary use of PFAS. And it was an easy ask of retailers. So we're basically saying to them, we don't want you to come up with a really complicated chemical alternative. We find an example here that just get rid of it. And it's, this, it's a similar concept to the cotton buds work that we did. So you pick one small thing, you highlight the issue, you show changes possible. And by doing that, you've highlighted the issue across the much wider group of chemicals and the much wider use. So the first thing that we had to do with this was to expel the arguments for continued use. So there was a perceived environmental benefits and there is consumer desire. Those are the two things that people would have argued against why they had to continue using it. Often the argument was made that stain resistant meant there was less washing and a longer lifespan for clothes, and that the benefits of those outweighed the negatives of using PFAS. So we carried out a survey of over 6,000 consumers. And we find that people who actively sought out stain resistant labels actually washed their clothes more frequently, and they replaced clothes more frequently than the people who didn't look for or specifically avoided stain resistant treatments. We also did some blind trials with parents in a local school find that they favoured the t-shirts with no treatment. And at the very least, this shows that the difference wasn't being noticed by the parents. 
we went into some of the detail, the technical detail of the actual finishes that were being sold. And we found that the stain resistant treatments, they were only guaranteed to last a specific number of washes, usually 20 to 30 washes. We worked that out and that was less than a school term. So, you know, these are washing out and people aren't getting long term benefit from them either. And they also require heat to reactivate after washing. So you have the stain resistant um, pair of trousers, you then wash it. And unless you dry that in a tumble dryer or iron it afterwards, then the treatment is completely ineffective. It needs heat to reactivate it again. So we were able to make this really solid case against continued use. And we also worked as part of a research consortium um, based in Sweden. So we were able to tap into that wealth of really primary research and bring that to the supermarkets that we were speaking to. Um, and the other thing that we did was that we asked nicely, you know, we took this information to the supermarkets and to the major clothing retailers that were making school uniforms. Um, and we discussed it with them. And, you know, this sometimes it's really, it's over, overlooked, but this was an issue they didn't know an awful lot about. And we presented them with the evidence. And now all the major supermarkets have phased PFAS out of their school uniforms. The high street shops are a bit slower. There is a lot of school uniform providers in the UK that are smaller outlets they haven't engaged with this and that's the reason why PFAS legislation is very important but I would say for us these supermarkets have been really responsive to this. So the next thing we started to look at was you know we could go after everybody or we could reprioritize. So we started looking at PFAS and food packaging. Um, and the reason we did that was because it's a really key and urgent priority in the UK. These are PFAS are used in the paper and the cardboard packaging they give it a grease repellency. And these are what are seen as a really sustainable alternative to plastic. So right now it's a market sector that's growing. It can also migrate into the food from the packaging itself. It's likely to be quite a minor um, component of our total exposure. I think environmental exposure is probably a bigger bit, but there is this human health concern. And also it's a really high turnover item. So the continual use and throwing out of packaging means that there's continual use and production of PFAS. And it's cutting that tap is what we're looking for. Um, but the first question was, well, how widespread is the problem? We knew it was used in food packaging in the US and in some of the European countries. There was very little information in the UK. We asked the supermarkets that we've been working with before. They didn't know if they were using it. Nobody could tell us the answer. So we did, we did a study ourselves. We started by using this very simple bead test. And that's something that everybody here can do at home. And I can put the link at the end with the full instructions. You just place a very small drop of everyday virgin olive oil. The better quality of the oil, the better the result onto food packaging. And the polarity of the liquid acts almost like two magnets pushing apart. The oil does not want to touch PFAS. And what happens is you get this really neat little bead of oil sitting on the material. And this gives it the very smallest possible surface area that is in contact. Um, so if there's, an, if there's no oil barrier, the oil will soak into the paper, very simply. If there's some sort of non-PFAS barrier, like a plastic coating, you'll find that it spreads out, but it holds in the surface. And if there's PFAS, it'll bead. It'll try and get away from the surface. And there's no other treatment that we know of that results in this bead. Um, so we tested a huge range of packaging, all from just shops and restaurants near us. Um, and the main thing to take from this was that we found 30% of the tested products produced a distinct olive oil bead. So there was a likely presence of PFAS. Um, we then wanted to take this further because it's a very simple and slightly unproven test. Um, so we picked things that had beaded. So we targeted our approach and we sent a certain amount of, we sent, I think, 20 samples away to get tested for total organic flooring, which is a proxy for total PFAS. And these are the, some of the things we tested. So we were focusing on greaseproof papers, microwave popcorn. If you want to try the bead test and want to know if it's working, if you have microwave popcorn, you will know, almost always get a bead. It's a really key use of PFAS. Also cookie bags, bakery bags, pizza boxes, the sort of uh, pastry bags that you're getting from takeaways. And we also tested these molded fiber compostable packaging. So these are the ones that are starting to replace polystyrene. We see there's a lot in the high street these days. Um, and what we find, sorry, I'm being very slow to switch from one to the other. So you don't need to know, don't need to take in everything that's on this graph. The main thing is that we were finding quite high concentrations. We find 
90% of the products that we sampled contained PFAS. Oh, eight out of the nine supermarkets that we targeted had products with PFAS in them. The ninth one, I only sent away one piece of packaging. So it's very likely that they do have packaging with PFAS in it. It just so happened the sample size was small because they're very expensive tests. We found PFAS in 100% of the takeaways that we sampled. And interestingly, worryingly, what we found was the highest concentrations by far were coming out in the molded fiber boxes. So these are the ones that are being advertised as compostable. These are what everyone is switching to. And that in itself is extremely worrying. So I put on here in red, you can't really see it because it's basically on the zero line, but this is the indicator value that's used in Denmark. So as of July this year, uh, July 2020, Denmark have banned the use of PFAS in food packaging. And they've put this limit of 10 micrograms per decimeter squared dry weight of total organic fluorine. Above that, they're saying it's been intentionally added. That's the limit that they, that they now accept in Denmark. We were finding 300 times that um, in these molded fiber compostable takeaway boxes. So huge concentrations. So what's the solution and what are we doing about this? So what we tend to do is we sort of look for this voluntary phase out. If we can get one or two supermarkets to accept there's a problem and to make changes, that gives us a really good case study to take forward for legislative action. And the legislative action, that's what brings the total phase out. So we kind of have this three pronged approach. Ultimately, what we want is legislation, but how we get there is that we work with the retailers. So who influences the supermarkets? Customers do, investors do, and direct communication. You know, we can influence them ourselves. So we work very closely with um, people like BRC. We have a lot of communications with the supermarkets directly with their packaging and their sustainability teams. We also do some work with international investors. So we're highlighting this problem to them and they themselves are then writing to supermarkets and putting pressure on the people to move away from PFAS. Um, and customers, you know, this is the really important public awareness part of it. So we worked with the Dark Waters movie when it came to the UK. We worked a lot with the impact campaign behind that, trying to bring UK relevance because this is a movie that's set in the States. It can be seen as an issue that's overseas and dealt with. And what we were trying to do was bring that relevance to the UK. Um, I, I was on Costing the Earth. So this sort of media and press where we're giving that UK perspective again. Um, and we sat on a lot of the uh, pre-screening Q&A panels. So again, adding the UK relevance, working with people like Rob Belot, who was the lawyer in the States and just bringing it to UK audience and the UK media to try and raise some attention. Um, we also started a, a petition. So this is this petition is now closed. We delivered it in February and we got almost 12,000 signatures. There is more than 12,000 in this picture, I realise, but some of them are duplications. So there was almost 12,000 in total when we delivered this. And this was asking the supermarkets to remove these forever chemicals, PFAS, from their food packaging. Um, we also have this bead test that we developed as part of the research report. We now have that as a public engagement tool, and we're asking the public to test their own packaging and submit the results to that to us. And that's got it's got two benefits. Firstly, it shows the public are engaged with this. It's more than just putting your name on a petition. It's showing supermarkets that people care enough to take action, to go on a computer and to input the data. So it's a, it's a step up and it shows that engagement, but it also collects really useful data. So the supermarkets themselves often don't know which of their packaging contains PFAS and they have to work with every supplier and ask all the right questions. And if we can use this data to give them a, a heads up to this is where you should be looking, you know, that's really beneficial to them. So it's actually supporting the retailers as well. And the other thing we're looking for is legislative change. So the EU recently committed to banning all non-essential uses of PFAS and we want the UK to do the same. So this was a really big announcement that came last year. Unfortunately, because we're not part of the EU, that doesn't come straight to us. We need to develop our own. So the UK government are currently working on a chemical strategy that is most likely due to be out in 2022. So that now is a really key time for us to be putting pressure on that, to convince policymakers to take action, not just on one chemical or the next chemical, but on the full group of PFAS. And the other big issue with this is that we have to define what is an essential use. 
So it's not just a ban on PFAS, it's a ban on non-essential uses. And that's really important um, because it's, it's whether the actual restriction is feasible and whether it works or not. So for example, mountaineers need waterproof clothing if they're at the top of Mount Everest. If PFAS is the only way to give them really properly good water repellent breathable clothing, and he's in the top of Mount Everest, that's an essential need. Does he need to be at the top of Mount Everest? That's a societal question. So there's, you know, there's depths to the different arguments. Medics do need scrubs that don't retain bodily fluids. And I'm, I'm not gonna argue with that, fair enough. Consumers really, really want stain-free stain carpets and clothing. Is that an essential use? Some people would argue that it's a consumer choice and that's something that we shouldn't legislate against. My argument would be different. And then we have more complex arguments like wind turbines, they run more efficiently with PTFE based lubricants. And obviously we have competing priorities here because we want to get rid of PFAS. There currently isn't a lubricant that works as well as PTFE, but we have to meet our climate targets. So there's a lot of depth and a lot of discussion going on. And there is a workshop every single day of the week if you wanted to attend it on the essential use concept, but it's really, really important to any future legislation. Um, so the other thing that we've been doing um, is that we've we brought this to Parliament. So this, this was a parliamentary event with Dr. Matthew Offord, um, Rob Belot and um, Basket Duncat, who's the UN Special Rapporteur for Toxic Chemicals. Uh, and this was for MPs to raise awareness so that they understood what PFAS was and that it's a current issue. We also wrote to the Secretaries of State for DEFRA, Biz and Health Brought, the, brought this to their attention, specifically asking for immediate action on food packaging, but also that the chemical strategy um, includes a non-essential PFAS ban. And we have a MPs briefing as well that we take out to people and to um, both MPs and MSPs to raise awareness of this. So just before Christmas, I think November last year, we had an ask going out asking our supporters to write to their MP, send them this briefing and ask them to take action on PFAS pollution. And we ended up getting, I can't remember the number of emails that were sent, but more than 70% of MPs across the UK received an, uh, our briefing from one of their constituents, asking them to take action. And it's, it's made a real difference. Ah, over 900 emails, there you go. Um, you know, this was, I put this together, this slide was put together a good few months ago. And at that point, there was eight new questions on forever chemicals. Now we're finding every couple of weeks, somebody's raising another question in Parliament about PFAS. It's now being discussed and it wasn't before. And that's really important because it's just such a key time to get the government talking about this and to be putting pressure on people. Um, so where are we now? We have supermarkets that are really engaged. You know, they've, they've, They've come from not knowing anything about PFAS to now they're talking about it. Now it's a question of when are they going to take action, not if they're going to take action for most of them. It is a big ask and they're listening. And I think that's really important. We have got a couple that have committed to taking action on food packaging. We can't get them to give us a timeline and they're not willing to go public yet. So it's, it's there and the momentum is building. There's fast food chains and food producers and they're setting deadlines to go PFAS free. So McDonald's are going PFAS free in their food packaging by 2025. Um, Nestle, they've said 2023. So big global companies are on board with this. Suppliers are starting to innovate um, different solutions so that they can be plastic free and PFAS free. And that's really important because what we don't want to do is switch away from plastic and find that we've got this whole new environmental problem. So it's getting people to say, we don't just want plastic free, we want plastic free and PFAS free. And that's so important. And we also have policymakers developing the UK chemical strategy. And they've recently announced that they're doing an RMOA, which is our risk management and options analysis on PFAS as a group. So they are now looking at over the next year, they will be dedicating a team to looking at what are the management options? What are the issues and what are we gonna do about PFAS? And that's a huge step forward. This time last year, I'd be drinking champagne if somebody told me that. You know, it's a brilliant step forward. And the public are start, starting to talk and they're starting to ask questions of their supermarkets, of their MPs. I've been invited to speak to you tonight. All of this shows that that public conversation is coming and that's what we really need so that we're driving this forward and we're putting it as a higher priority. And that's me done. So open to questions. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody again. Wow. Um, 
that was um that was really really <laughs> that was really good that was really good to, really that was a really great presentation it very powerful and um yeah really really insightful i really appreciate it and it's um yeah because you know there's like there's a lot to learn and you know we i i kind of feel like i've learned a lot but there's there's so much more that i'm learning and yeah this is it's really really interesting to learn more about this subject because I heard like like it was interesting interesting for me because like I'd heard about the Dark Waters film, but I I just it was one of those things where it was like well it's it's an American so I don't really know that was kind of when when I first heard about it I was like well it's an American thing I didn't know you know I just thought oh that's an American issue and so that was really difficult for me to understand that so um, I guess when COVID like, and that film release it probably hasn't helped as well so I hope maybe maybe we can try and push more on that. Um, yeah, you're right, because it went into cinemas for just a couple of weeks before the cinemas closed. <laughs> so, yes, at least it got to cinemas. We were worried it was going to stop for a while. <laughs> yeah, may maybe we could look at kind of um, pushing more on that and, and, and um, you know, trying to push that again, because obviously now, yeah, as, as we kind of come out of COVID and like people can start going back to cinemas again and things, I think it would almost be good for a re-release, I think it would be really useful. Or like, you know, at least look at kind of things like community showings or, um, you know, screenings or whatever like that and, and kind of talks and, and this kind of stuff. And yeah, almost it, we, we, we need it. We need your presentation all over the world. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what yeah. we need, we need, because we need people to understand the situation. So I think that's really important. So yeah, the more we can get to get this out and the word out about it, the better. Yeah, there's also, I mean, the movie is based on the book called Exposure and that's by Rob Ballot. And if, you know, if you fancy scaring yourself, that's, it's a really good book. Um, it's very technical and it's very detailed because he's a, he's a lawyer. So it, there's a lot of legal side of it, but it's a, it's a very good what, uh, read as well. Yeah. Um... Actually, I, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. I'm not a scientist. I'm a linguist. I am. Um, I, I just, thank you. All I can say is thank you. You know, I, I've been involved in Greenpeace for many, many, many years and very aware of the you know the their campaign on the clothing thing particularly but th this it has been mentioned before in one of greg's one of your other um uh things that you put on greg and it was mentioned and a bit talked about and i thought oh but you've kind of blown me away with your expertise and your knowledge and how we're all blinded by science and none of us know we don't know this we do not know this and we are the people who are who are subject to this pollution of our everyday world and it, it's shocking and they need to pull their finger out and sort it out you know i i just thank you Kerry, for all your hard work and all your all your well what can i say just amazing i think you're right i think you know it's something that we find with chemicals in general it's a very hard topic to talk to the general public about you know it's it does wash over people and i think because it's so complex to understand and to make decisions about you know you can go in and you can choose not to take plastic but you just don't know what's in anything else because it's an ingredient list and i think that complexity means that it's something that we just the public just aren't engaging with um, hopefully it's something that's coming up and you know people are starting to be conscious of but it is a very difficult communications issue <laughs> yeah absolutely because obviously you know you can you can you know you look at the thing you look at a plastic option and you look at a paper option or whatever and you think well okay my conscious is I see it I see it a paper option I'm gonna go for that <laughs> but that you know like and, and so obviously you know you can understand that but it, you know you can't you just can't you know you can't do these beads tech you know when you go to Greg's or whatever yes you, know, you can't buy, walk in you know, with your olive oil ready <laughs> yeah exactly. exactly you know you can't you can't bring around olive oil to test around when you're out shopping and about out and about can you so that's you know that's a real challenge and it's it's, it's a real serious issue I think you know that SLES in um, SLSs and SLESs in in hair products and in shampoos and things like that that people are now perhaps a little bit more aware of. Um, I bought. I remember I, I had to buy a, pa a pan, or I, I ended up bought, buying a wok or something. And I was looking at all the labelling, and I was thinking that it said something free, and I was thinking, oh, that must be good then. But I didn't know what it was referring to. I'll look it up then when I at some point I'll look it up. 
So I did buy the wok and uh, I didn't look it up. Because well, interestingly, if you bought a wok, what it probably said on the label was PFOA free. That's what most of them advertised as. So PFOA is one chemical and that's the one that's talked about in dark waters. Right. If it says PFOA free, more than likely that means they're using a different PFAS. Yeah. Almost if there's no label, it might not contain it. But if it says PFOA free, that means they've switched to a different PFAS. Which is very frustrating because, you know, even, you know, you're going to go out of this and, you know, PFAS doesn't stick in your head. You're going to see PFOA and you're going to think that's the one I'm looking for. And it's, it's very, very hard for the public when you're doing that to them. Because as you say, you see, it's something free. I don't know what the something is, but they're advertising it. So it must be a good thing. Um, and that, that false advertising is something that's really, really difficult to deal with. And, you know, you don't want to turn people off because, you know, you've obviously done the right thing and you've gone out and you've tried to buy something. And then, you know, for that to come back at you, I think that really puts the public off trying to make this effort when it's so difficult sometimes. We all try to do the right thing. And when you yeah. try to do the right thing, and my God, I've done the, I've got it wrong again. And then it brings you down. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very very difficult, isn't it? All these choices that we have to At make. Least I don't buy takeaways. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. And, and yeah. you know, it's the compostables as well. You know, that's a really important one. So all of the molded fiber compostables that we tested have high levels of concentration. And there's another report coming out from Europe. I think it's coming out today tomorrow actually. And they've done the same. And these compostable molded fiber ones almost always, in fact. All of the ones that have been tested have very high concentrations of PFAS. And that's because the sugar cane or the bagasse that they're made out of, there just is no grease repellency or water repellency. If you put something greasy in it and there isn't a really good waterproofing, it will fall through. So almost always those compostables are a really high source. And then if you think about what happens to them afterwards, yeah, you if you compost it, going you're, the, and you're putting going it straight to... in the environment, My straight into your God. soils, straight into your crops. So it's a real big issue. We can't win, can we? <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> we just can't win on anything that we do. Um, uh, Isabel, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, you just put your hand up. But um, we'll come, we, I know people have written questions in the chat, so we will definitely come to those, I promise. Um, but yeah, do you want to go? Do you want to go yeah, Isabel? I'll go. Um, I was just wondering, you said McDonald's are trying to go PFAS free. And... But it seems to me like it would be very hard to do that with food. Um, and also, I have a lot of businesses asking me, you know, should I switch to compostables? Um, so what is the ideal scenario right now? So there, there really are solutions. So as I say, Denmark have actually banned this since July last year. So if you buy any packaging in Denmark, it won't. Well, they can still sell out stock at the moment. So there may be PFAS in it. But come back in six months time, there won't be PFAS in any of the food packaging in Denmark. And Denmark sells food, so it's possible. The Danish co-op is one of the biggest supermarkets in Denmark. They got rid of PFAS in their food packaging in 2015. The one that was really difficult for them to replace, so they find a replacement for everything else. Microwave popcorn, they find really hard, and it was because it was it's to do with the heat and grease repellency that was required. So they actually pulled microwave popcorn from the shelves. They were told it was impossible. They couldn't come up with a solution, so they stopped selling microwave popcorn. Six months later, their supplier came back and said, we've, we've cracked it. So now you can buy microwave popcorn. But they just pulled it from the shelf, innovated, sorted. So McDonald's, um, they have McDonald's in Denmark. They are selling chips in packaging that doesn't have PFAS. Um, so they already have the packaging. They're selling it in some countries and they're not selling in others. So the alternatives are completely out there. Compostables, the molded fiber is tricky. You know, I know there's different seaweed based alternatives and people are looking into different things. More than likely what they're doing is that they're going to move back towards these sort of corrugated uh, cardboard and they're finding there's solutions for that more than the bagasse sort of ones. Um, so sometimes it is a material change. Sometimes it's a different chemical, but a, a better one. Um, so there, but there is alternatives. Other people have done it. They're doing it all over the world. <laughs> And that, that'll be really useful, Karen, because I know um, on that presentation, you said that you, you know, you're building a list of suppliers that are plastic free and PFAS free. 
I think that that would be a really useful, that is, that is the, the ultimate list, I feel like, you know, that's what- It's short list, but it's a short list because we've not done the research. List. If we can all, <laughs> if we can all help um, work on, compi you know, compiling that, that would be really useful. And I think, you know, we can try and get all the other um, NGOs on board as well, you know, I think this really needs to kind of get over to like Service Against Sewage and, you know, like Friends of the Earth and things. And, and I think, you know, the more we can shout out about it, then the more we can all we can all do something because I think um, you know like it just it just we just need it you know businesses are calling uh, you know wanting the plastic free solutions and we need to we, <laughs> you know we, we need to provide them and that so like you know I definitely think if we can link that yeah I don't, I don't know if you've spoken to service against sewage but obviously you know the, the plastic free communities network has got over 700 groups mm -hmm. you know and I, I think it would be really useful tapping into that and if we can all work together to try and compile a list of suppliers or uh, I don't know sort of all, all help you out a bit I think it'd be great yeah I, so I have a briefing that I put together for um it was actually for some of the student unions but it's it's what to do if you're buying or using food packaging and you know some of the the major recommendation really is just ask your supplier because some of these people they are innovating and they know what's a problem but they're not telling people it's a problem and they're not promoting the PFAS free versions. And that's because they don't think their customers want it. So, you know, we've, we've spoken to one of the really major compostable companies and they are working on this, but they're working at it quietly and behind the scenes. They have an alternative that they trialed with people. It, it's not as white. So there's aesthetic differences and it's slightly more expensive. So their customers aren't liking the new solution, but then they're not telling them what the problem is. So what we need is people to ask for it and start, if you put the pressure on suppliers and say, do you have a PFAS free alternative? That's when they start to bring it up and it becomes mainstream. So asking the question is just the first thing to do. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And I think, yeah, the more we, more we ask, the more people start thinking about it. So that's great. I wanted to come back to some of the questions in the chat because um, we've got quite a few now. So Suzanne said about once in the environment, is there any way that PFAS can be removed? Um, small scale contamination. So it's used in firefighting foams. A lot of uh, so big firefighting foams for airports, military bases. If it's in the environment there, it's some of it is contained and you can decontaminate, but only where it's a particular direct spill. It's really mobile. So once it gets properly out into the wider environment, then no, there's nothing you can do. There are some ways to take it out of drinking water, but it's very expensive. It's not something that drinking water um, companies are doing at the moment. So it, it's very difficult to get out of the environment. It's something that we have to stop the source. Otherwise, it just builds up. All the PFAS that's ever been produced basically is in the environment. The yeah, only way to the destroy it is... Yeah. When we talk about single-use plastics, you know, every single piece of plastic single use plastic is still in the environment now and, and it and it's exactly the same it's you know it's coming down as rain and we're falling, finding it in yeah. our bodies we're finding it in you know it's exactly the same thing really yeah absolutely the only way to get rid of it is high temperature incineration and you know even that's not 100 percent effective and we have i think two high temperature incineration centers in the uk yeah yeah and 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 like you said you know the best way to do it is to turn it off at the source and we it's exactly what we do when we talk about single use plastic we talk about it has to come you have to you have to turn it off at the source because, yeah anything yeah. else is a small part of the problem it's never going to fix the problem exactly yeah absolutely um Chantel, i don't know if you wanted to come in and unmute or speak. i think um kerry's picked it up actually and that was really how accessible is it to to the cafes you know when we're talking to them so having that list will be absolutely great yeah i mean it's it, like i say it's a short list of companies i know that do it but i do know that some of the major suppliers have alternatives and if, if people ask for them they'll get the alternative definitely yeah that's really that's really great um yeah ruth said dark waters is available on amazon prime if you want to watch it so that's that's always really useful to know and i think um yeah obviously if, yeah obviously you need an amazon prime account but obviously that's really if we can share share it then a good a good number of people might have that account so we can and my bit of promotion is that it is actually very good and um I, you know i met rob Belot and he is exactly as his character is in the movie. It's very, very true to life. They even wore his suits. They filmed it in his office and they wore his suits. So it is very true to life. 
Yeah. Um, Pete says, um, just a few other places you can find these things, your phone screen, dental floss, contact lenses, guitar strings. Yeah. It's all it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> People must think, how do you live? How can, how can we live without it now? Because it is just in so many things. It just seems... Well, I think Crazy, it's it? this pragmatic approach and that's, I think it's really important and it's something that we try to talk when we're saying to retailers, we are not saying ban all PFAS everywhere in the world because, you know, there are medical functions and it is saving people's lives in certain circumstances. What we have to do is cut down everything that's unnecessary so that we can focus on finding alternatives to where it really is useful. So one of the things that they use it for, which I discovered recently, is waterproofing on swimming costumes that's unnecessary we don't need waterproof swimming costumes i think it probably makes you glide through the water slightly faster maybe it makes them dry faster but you know we need to get rid of those so that when we're using pfas we're really getting a benefit from it yeah definitely yeah and it's 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 just it's just you know all the things you say you know it's the same you know it's the same when we talk about plastics as well because there are there are necessary plastics you know, and, and that's the thing, we, you know, we're called plastic free, Chesterfield, whatever, you know, we, we're not, you know, we always have to tell people we're not, we're not against all plastics. So there are some really useful plastics and it's, um, you know, it's one of those things, especially with like all the, co you know, the COVID, um, you know, um, tests and stuff like that, you mm. know, the amount of plastic that's kind of generated from that. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's one of those things you have to say, actually, well, it's, it's just part of, yeah, part of things and yeah, we have to look at the unnecessaries. Um, yeah, so Pete, Pete said we used wax paper pre PFAS. Surely we can go back to that. Yep, good point. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes okay. it's not a complicated alternative. <laughs> yeah. Laura, do you want to come back? I know you had a hat. If anyone else wants to come in and, and uh, speak, um, please, please put in hat or type in the chat box. Um, it's, not, it's not really it's not really a question actually it's just like how can chemists live with themselves when they know that what they're producing or or how can mm, you know producers who 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 sell the, the this they know that you, you're selling uh and you're retailing or you're dealing with a persistent um chemical like this which is causing causing so much pollution invisible it's all invisible how can they actually <laughs> kind of carry on doing that how, how do people do that how do it's the same with fossil fuel companies though isn't it Laura you know look at like Exxon Mobil and Shell and you know how how can they how can they <laughs> yeah it's, it's everyone that we uh, that we're unhappy with isn't it it's it's the whole shebang so yeah, and, and you think look at look at investors and stuff as well, you know, because you know PFAS is in so many things. You know, the invest investors will be right behind it because if they're going to get some money out of it, then uh, you know they think it's a good thing, don't they? You know, and it, this is the thing, and it you know it just reminds me of all the stuff about like all the campaign on, on against fracking, and um, you know that that was kind of such a you had such a strong um, industry backing to it, and. Um, investors were really behind it and everything as well, but you know we've we've managed to ban you know we've managed to ban it's back like here in the UK. Isn't it? It's this capitalist world that we live in, and that's how it is. It's, but but it is possible to sh you know I think that's the thing, isn't it? You know, like it was the same with fracking. Like they banned they banned fracking in various number of countries. They've banned single use plastics in a number of countries, and they've banned PFAS in a, a number of countries. Yeah. So we know it is possible. Yeah. Um, it might be quite challenging in terms of like you know strong inv investors um investors links and stuff like that i mean yeah you know there's it's, it's going to be a challenge to try and fight it but the more we raise awareness about it the better really spread the word spread kerry's word <laughs> it's also i think sometimes it's putting the cost on it you know sometimes you have to just work with that capitalism too so it's things like the extended producer responsibility and saying like if you are the one that makes this pollution mess even if it happens in 10 years time, if we find out there's a problem, you're the one that's going to have to clean it up. That that's puts the onus crazy. on them yeah. to develop better chemicals in the first place. And we're not doing that at the minute. The public cleans it up with public money. That's what Greenpeace moved towards doing, working with industry, working with companies, working with retailers, 
especially Iceland in the early days where the uh, the, uh, uh, the refrigerants when yeah and um, I think it does work and in the, in the this day and age I think that is the only way forward and ultimately then towards legislation yeah thank you ever so much Kerry yeah it's really it's really fascinating and I think yeah it's just it's just um it's just annoying it's kind of on the, like annoying and an annoying thing isn't it it's like we're telling people to go plus you know reduce their single use plastics and and the, you know and it's like you know but then they'll be like oh but then I want to go for that but I don't know if it's got PFAS so it's like it's just another ethical dilemma that we all face which is just going to be really frustrating um yeah so it's it's going to be a real challenge but um hopefully the more we talk about it and the more we can like the business our businesses you know look at if we if we can kind of tie that in and and you know look if we can kind of get the word out to all the certificate and sewage plastic free communities and they can speak to all of their businesses that they're you know that they've signed up as plastic free champion businesses um yeah the more we can kind of get the get them talking to their suppliers to mention about PFAS the more yeah more chance we have to try and do something about but thanks yeah thanks um yeah Kerry for sharing lots of lots of links we can share Just putting those. a couple of different links up there that I will explain in a second <laughs> I will I will share any links on um I'll do an email around after afterwards yeah um, so I put this the first one is to the bead test so that's the public one and there's a little video on that made by my six-year-old <laughs> that explains how to do it so it's very clear what to do the next one is a YouTube video so it's I think it's maybe two minutes long just a sort of animated one that explains the issue and the last one is an interview I did for the Glasgow Science Centre so it's about a 13 14 minute if you want more depth but it's again it's, it's kind of like this presentation it's me being interviewed and explaining the PFAS issue but that's live at the moment um, for Science Week. Um, and I will also, I'll send you the briefing that I made for the um, buyers and purchasers, if that's interesting, and you can pass that on if need be. Yeah, that would be really useful, because I mean, if we can then pass it on to our Plastic Free Champion businesses, for example, then yeah, definitely, because uh, they're probably all going to hate me now, aren't they? They're going to think, why have you you've pestered, you've pestered me to reduce my single use plastic? This is what I I've, feel like. <laughs> Every time I speak to a packaging department in a supermarket and they just look at me aghast. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's like you feel that like you're doing the right thing, but then you just don't know. So it's yeah, it's, it's a real it's a real pain. Um, but absolutely, yeah. And I think um, you know, it's it's a real challenge as well, especially like if the alternatives are more like one of the things I always worry about is like if the alternatives or you know, if the PFAS free products are more expensive. And what about the people who want to go, you know, want to try and reduce this, but then they, they can't, you know, due to, you know, their finances or, you know, this kind of thing. And it, it you always have that kind of ethical dilemma of a lot, of, you know, a lot of plastic free products tend to be a lot more, you know, can be more expensive. And it could be, that maybe it's the same for PFAS free products, they're more expensive. And then you think, well, how, how do people who haven't got that, that extra money to spend on these, how, how are they able to afford that, those kind of products? But that's why you said that, you know, that's where ideally you need to come back at, right at the top at the source, because if you ban it right at the source, then it means that people won't be buying this, whatever the cost. And interestingly, actually, I mean, it's, yeah, you bring that up. So we haven't worked specifically on cosmetics, but PFAS is used a lot in cosmetics. And there was a Danish study that came out and they looked at, you know, which cosmetics it was in. And interestingly, they find it wasn't a it wasn't that it wasn't in high-end products. I think they actually find high-end products sometimes had more PFAS in them, but certainly there was a good range across the whole. So it wasn't, it, you know, it's not a prime ingredient, basically. So you can get the cheap stuff with or without it, and you can get the expensive stuff with or without it. So there may be cases like food packaging where initially it's more expensive, but, you know, sometimes that's just scaling up. But actually in a lot of uses, sometimes you can just get rid of it. So it's actually cheaper to manufacture. If you don't stain resistant, that's one less thing for them to add in the manufacturing process and it should be cheaper. So there will be circumstances just because you're changing machinery, but yeah, it doesn't have to be. Long-term, actually a lot of these things can come out quite evenly priced. Yeah, that's really that's really good to know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex, so, so complex, isn't it? And it, yeah, you know, when, when you're a consumer, 
looking at all these products it's it's how, how do you look at that and say you know you know that, that's why I kind of you almost not need an ethical consumer kind of rating in a sense for like for every product and you know like what's the yeah are you working with ethical consumer like and are they are they aware of yeah they're aware of it so they've they've published a couple of blogs for us and in fact there was an article in their recent magazine as well on PFAS that we wrote for them so yeah they're very aware of the issue and I think chemicals in general is something that they look at but it is very tricky I think chemicals is something that the public influence is to show that it's something they want and they care about actually but what we need is the government to take action because like you say it is always going to be too complex for the average consumer we have to be able to trust that the products are safe Definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, you'll be good. You'll be glad to hear that um, we wrote to a Chesterford M um, MP about this, about PFAS, and he, he, um, Toby Perkins, he was in support of everything you're doing to reduce this issue. And he, he's, he did, you know, he wrote to me in December saying he, he's going to work with his Labour colleagues to, to take put pressure on the government to, to, to reduce PFAS. So let's hope that. <laughs> Yeah, you never know when politicians, you know, they just sort of say stuff and <laughs> yes. you never know whether they're going to hold, hold the word to it. But I think, you know, we need to keep up the pressure, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. And just keep keep raising the issue because uh, it's really, really important that, that our politicians hear about this. Does anyone have any other questions? I think um, I, I've just, I've really enjoyed it and it's been really great, really insightful. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and I can't wait to share. I'm gonna write an article about this, and I'll um I'll put it on the webs our website, and I'll share yeah everything, all of the links and everything with that <coughs> as well. But yeah, I will um I'll put my email address into this, and if anybody wants to come to me about anything, that's fine. Thanks, Chloe. Yeah, that's really useful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, we'll, we can definitely share your email if anyone's got any other questions. Once they yeah once they watch the recording of this as well. So that would be really useful. So, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's really, we really, yeah, really appreciate you coming and talking because it's, yeah, it's great just to kind of get this word out and uh, we'll definitely help get the word out even further for you. So thanks for all, all the great work you're doing. Really, it's very impressive and it, we just got to keep, keep going. And I'm glad that one, you know, that at least you, you guys are on this and uh, yeah, it's really, really important issue. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, this shows that there's interest, which is brilliant. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for everything you're doing. Right, thanks, thanks a lot. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>